السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحمل فلا من يحمل الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلي فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشحر الأمور مكثاتها وكل متثات بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him and seek His help. We ask His forgiveness and seek refuge with Him from our soul's evil desires and our wrongdoings. He whom Allah guides, no one can misguide. And he whom Allah chooses to lead astray, there is no guidance for Him. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Indeed, the best speech is the speech of Allah, the Quran. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad. The worst of matters in religion are those invented by people, for every innovation is a bid'ah. And every bid'ah is an act of misguidance that leads to the hellfire. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we ask Allah's guidance and mercy and forgiveness. And we recount His words in the Quran: "اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا." That before the end of the life of Prophet Muhammad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him this verse confirming that the religion was perfect and complete. And perfect can't be proven and complete. You don't need to add to it. So it's something very important to remember in all aspects of our religion that it was left perfect and complete by the Prophet وسلم, and there's no need of any speculations or additions by us. Today's uh, topic concerns divorce. And we know that divorce is in the Quran, it's part of our religion. Indeed, there is a whole surah, surah of talat, that deals with this issue. So Allah has made our religion complete, and in the religion is this facility of divorce. Yet in so many places in the Muslim world, not only the subcontinent, but also the subcontinent, they have made it almost Haram is almost forbidden. It's very rare that it happens. And more to the point, it's made almost impossible for a divorced woman to remarry. And this was not the religion brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He married Zainab, who was a divorced woman. And of course he married widows also. So what the Prophet did should be okay for us. And we can't make our own rules on this. That no woman's been divorced, she goes back to her father, that's the end of it. She spends her life in chastity. It's ridiculous. 
As far as the divorce itself is concerned, there's a lot of misunderstandings. First of all, people think, especially non-Muslims think, that all the man has to do is to say the talaq three times and that's the end of it. But actually it's not as simple as that. There are conditions that have to be fulfilled. The first one is that the woman cannot be divorced during her menstrual period. The woman cannot be divorced while she's having her monthly period. And we know now in modern psychology and modern medicine that the condition known as premenstrual tension or premenstrual syndrome makes the woman very tetchy and awkward. The coming of the menstrual period changes a woman's character. And this person is something that I would teach young men getting married, you know, if they haven't noticed it already, that it's much more relevant than sexual technique, which can be learned with a bit of experience. The psychology of the woman, often a lot of it is based on her hormonal changes. And the, the coming of the menstrual period brings a change of character in many women. Sometimes a great change of character. And the young husband is shocked, where's this sweet woman I married? Where's this nice girl I married? Suddenly she's throwing flakes at me. So, a divorce cannot be pronounced while the woman is menstruating. Because the short-term memory loss and the often agitated mannerisms that the woman adopts during that time uh, are not in keeping with her real character. So if one takes advantage of that, I mean, if one falls into the trap of of uh, divorcing a woman before her period, then he's made it an error. And during the period itself, it is forbidden, and it's always been forbidden. Also, it's forbidden in a time when, between the periods, when the woman had a woman and the man have been together in sexual relations. If a man has pronounced, what I mean by this is, if a man has pronounced a divorce and then has physical relations with a woman, either full sexual intercourse or some affectionate touching, uh, this nullifies the talaq, has to start again. Because if he's drawn to sexual attraction to the woman, then there's a chance the marriage will be patched up. Also forbidden is a divorce pronounced by a man in a, bad, a wild rage that he's lost his temper to such an extent that he's almost suffering from temporary insanity. And it happens. Let's look at all of us here. It's happened uh, at some time or other. Because the Prophet said in the Hadith, something like the Senate, that divorce is not valid during a mental seizure. If the man is so wild and out of control with rage, then that divorce he pronounces is not valid. The divorce, once pronounced, has to be renewed through three menstrual cycles, three periods, for it to become a proper divorce. And during that time, she should stay in the house. I know today, many Muslim societies, the woman is thrown out after the first pronouncement. But she should stay in the house. And this allows some arbitration from the families. 
in the families of the man and the families of the woman, and if they don't have families, like many of us convert Muslims, we don't have these uh, families, then some friends and people who know us, they can come and try and give some good advice, try and see if this thing cannot be patched up. And especially if there are children, uh, it's not a good thing, but at the same time it's not forbidden. We have to understand it. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, many companions, the best of Muslims, the best of mankind, they divorced. Umar had two divorces. Umar ibn al-Khattab had two divorces. Abu Bakr divorced, Uthman divorced. It happened. Because they had a system whereby after her idda, the woman could remarry. There was no stigma on a woman that she divorced. But in the modern society, especially in the subcontinent, you have this thing that she's divorced, it's like she's some kind of um, bad luck charm, you know, nobody else can go near her. So this is not a part of Islam, the divorced woman has no chance to remarry. She should remarry. The woman, uh, especially a young woman, left to live a life of celibacy, she's unhappy at best and disturbing at worst. If the woman is pregnant at the time of divorce, then the idda starts after the delivery, if it's more than three months to the delivery. And it's, the idda starts in three months' time, if the pregnancy is less than three months. And there again, we have the principle of reconciliation, especially if a child is coming along. So, in the final analysis, it's actually true to say that in many Western countries, divorce is much easier than in, in the Muslim society. In America, they have this thing, the Mexican divorce, or the Las Vegas divorce. There's some Elvis impersonator can divorce you in five minutes in Las Vegas. And um, the whole thing becomes uh, something of a farce. So we have to bear in mind, dear brothers and sisters, first of all, there is no particular stigma on a person if they have to divorce. It happens. Some people are just not made to live together. And if we do the proper Islamic system where they don't know each other and they don't meet each other, apart from a brief introduction, I mean to say, I mean they're not dating, then the marriage has to be easily put into reverse should things go wrong. At the same time, there has to be a collection of wise heads amongst the families of the people to give them advice and to try and help them through difficulties that will definitely occur in marriage. It needs some understanding, dear brothers and sisters. It needs some understanding and it needs some advice and the psychology of the individual, as usual, has to be looked into. But we should understand that divorce is a part of our religion. There's a surah in the Quran called the surah of divorce, of thought. And it's had, it is something that many of the best Muslims in history have done. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Sometimes the surgeon's knife is the only cure. And there's no reason why a couple should live in misery because of family pressure. That they should, if they cannot reconcile, they divorce and they get on with their lives with somebody else. And the example is there in the Saudi society, now for all their faults, and every society has faults, much of the sunnah of the Prophet stays in the Saudi society that they marry and divorce. And you find sometimes 
uh, a woman has been married and divorced three times. It's not looked upon as something bad. It's just one of those things. There is no taboo in it. For Hindus, yes, because now they, they can't... Uh, the British stopped them burning their widows so that an unmarried woman, a woman who's divorced, she's looked upon as something shameful and goes to the parents, her parents' house as in, like a slave. But we shouldn't copy them. So I want you to think about this and anybody who doubts it, please read up the relevant hadith and the sort of the talaq, especially if you have uh, Quran with tafsir in your own language that you try and understand this very important aspect. O praise to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, we praise Him and call down blessings upon His most noble messenger, Muhammad. The Sunnah of the Prophet was formed to an extent by the customs of the people. The Quraysh Arabs, uh, they had many customs that were against Islam and they were thrown out, but those that were in harmony were kept. And one of the things they used to do was they married more than one woman. And this is something that unfortunately seems to have stopped amongst the majority of Muslims today. And we receive so much heavy propaganda from the Kufar about this. But as we've said before, what the Kufar object to actually is marriage. Not one man having many women in his life, because many of the Kufar, the men, uh, because marriage is, has more or less died out in the Western society, they have access to a huge pool of single women actresses, air hostesses, shop girls, prostitutes, so many. Look at Dubai. So marriage is the thing they object to. And when the French and the British came and conquered the Muslim lands, the Dutch in Indonesia and the Italians in Libya, one thing that scared them was the population growth of the Muslims that a man would have four wives and forty children. And it scared them, so they began to work against this in no uncertain terms, making it more and more difficult economically, socially, and through their propaganda, not to marry more than one woman and to keep the number of children small. Please, brothers, if you can move forward a little bit now, the crowd's coming in. Give them some space so they don't have to sit out in the sun. That, as we always say, you have to pray in rows, but you don't have to sit in rows. You can sit together. <coughs> Nowadays, with the economic situation, it's very difficult. I met a man some years ago from Mali in Central West Africa. And uh, he said, you know, in his community, marrying is very easy. First of all, it's an accepted custom that a man has more than one wife. And if a man of 30-something who, who has a flourishing business or farm, if he doesn't have more than one wife, they make jokes about him. So he said that in our society, tribal society, it's very easy 
You just build a hut made of mud and a roof of thatch, thatch straw, and you go to her father and offer a few cattle, a few goats, and you slaughter a goat for the walima, and it's, it's done. There's no telephone bill, no electricity bill, no rent. It's very simple and straightforward. Of course, these days it's not so simple and straightforward. There's a lot of expense comes into it. But we have made things difficult for ourselves. And the divorce problem, to come back to that, the divorce problem starts with marriage. The prophets of the Lord said that a man marries for four reasons. And of course, by inference, the woman also. Piety, religiousness is one. Beauty is another. Money is a third. And good family is a fourth. But these four things are reasons for marrying. And they're not forbidden in Islam. But the Prophet said, you make piety the first one. Nowadays, there's some kind of panic in the Muslim society, here and elsewhere. They say, our divorce rate is going up. Our society is falling to pieces. What are we going to do? Well, you have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. And he's told you what to do. That when you marry, you look first for the piety. If you want money and beauty, it's not wrong. It's quite normal. Good family. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good point. But if those things are taken without the piety, and especially nowadays, you look at those internet sites, Muslim marriages, it's all about salary. You know? Salary. Okay, right. He's, earn he's earning enough. Let's see what he's like. So if you make salary the first one, then, you know, how can you expect a stable marriage based on that? And you're wondering why the divorce rates are going up. Come on. This greed for money and making marriage like a business, in some countries, some of the Arab countries, you know, like in Sham and Egypt and things, they have terrible strain on the poor man, you know, the poor young man, he's trying to amass enormous amounts of money so he can get married. And this money usually goes into the pocket of her father. So the father's like selling her, you know. Whereas in Islam, the dowry is supposed to be for the girl, it's supposed to be for the woman. And she can remit it back to her husband if she wishes. Or she can give it to her father if she wishes. Or she can give it to her brother if she wishes. There's a case here. One local family, uh, a girl got a big dowry. She gave it to her brother so he could get married. Very nice. Very practical. But this thing, the problem of divorce starts with marriage. That you have to have Islamic intention proper intention when you get married that you're looking for somebody pious. Because if that's not done, the whole basis is false. It's on a false premise and it starts to fall away and our warning is with the Western societies that they used to marry for that reason. You know, at one time, like in my father's day, that's what the marriage talk was about. Because they used to have arranged marriages. Uh, for example, in, in Ireland, in the early 20th century, there was no marriage but arranged marriages. Whether the person was poor or rich. You couldn't, a man could not play fast and loose with a woman. In the Catholic society, and they had big families, 
So if somebody's playing around with someone's daughter or sister, and if he gets her pregnant, if he got her pregnant, we had the system in early known as the shotgun wedding, where the father and the, the brothers of the girl would arrive at the door of the boy with a broken shotgun, you know, not put together, and, but loaded, and they'd say, what's it to be? The shotgun of the wedding. And it sounds a bit patan, you know, but I mean, that's what they used to do. Nowadays, this has disappeared completely. No brother cares what his sister is doing. No father cares what his daughter is doing. Almost none. I won't say all, but mostly. They expect that they're going to have affairs. And they expect that they're going to have... You know, the brother, the son is having this girl and then that girl and the daughter is having this boy and then that boy and eventually they might find somebody they live with. Nobody's bothering to get married anymore. It doesn't mean anything. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, that we, and especially our children, don't fall into that trap. Why should we keep our sons tormented into their early 20s? when their sexual desires are its strongest. Why should we keep them single? It's a disaster. I know I've worked in a university here, and you see so many Muslim boys and girls having affairs, because they're mixed up. That's the first thing, you know, they mix and they meet each other. And the parents will not allow them to get married. They say, no, you have to finish your education, you have to amass some money, and then maybe we'll think about it. It's not working. It's not working. Already, zina is prevalent amongst such boys and girls here. It's, it's endemic. And what comes after that? Broken hearts, Stern minds, unwanted pregnancies, abortions. It's a whole mess. And we're not even talking about divorce now, this is before the marriage. So we have to keep to the Sunnah of the Prophet that had this system from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not only us, I mean the communities before us, the Christians and the Jews, they also had this system that the children are married young and all good advice is given to them especially when they have their first arguments and their first difficulties that these things will pass don't make a big deal of it it's not a divorcing issue if you, you know the way it's too much salt in the food or something and he gets angry it is nothing we older people who've been through this we have to give advice to the younger ones about it and the issue of children and how to look after them how to protect them how to keep them in a stable family environment all these things are very important and it's there in the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu we take that rather than taking what the MTV and ZTV and all this stuff has to offer us. Allah warns us in the Quran, you know, that if we don't follow His deen, we will have a wretched life. We turn our back on His guidance. We will have a wretched life. We will not be happy. It doesn't matter how many noughts you've got behind your fingers in the bank account. We won't be happy. And we know this. So we have to start living by it. We have to make the change. We have to make the change. It starts with us. We get our children married young. We put aside all this Bollywood, Hollywood stuff about romance and expensive marriages. And we get our children married young to protect them. And at this time in history, they need protection more than they did in the past. So we ask Allah to have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. We ask Allah to guide us the straight path. We ask Allah that we may be inspired by the Sunnah of the Prophet. And we ask Allah to forgive.
forgive our sins, have mercy on us, and guide us aright. Amen.